Hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of I'm with Phil. It has been a while since I did a podcast, and I thought, you know, I probably should because a lot has happened since my last podcast. Um, a lot has happened, not just to me, but the whole world, and most likely to you too. You know, we we've we, we've had our whole lives turned upside down because of the pandemic, the coronavirus. And I'm not going to speak lightly about it because it has been deadly, like all viruses. This one has killed many, many people throughout the world and quite a few people in our own country. So it can be deadly, especially if it affects uh, people who already have some pre-existing conditions, some health issues, some health weaknesses. And obviously those people need to be extremely careful. So I'm not going to talk about masks or or the upcoming, um, the upcoming, uh, what's the word? The, uh, I was going to say inoculation, uh, um, just forgot what it's called. The government's putting together in the Trump administration, the, uh, <laughs> I'm probably going to have to edit this part because I totally went blank. Um, what is it called? This is like a game now. It's, it's like, uh, you're all guessing and you're telling me, Phil, it's called, it's called, and I cannot remember. The vaccine. Thank you. You know, this, this head's been around for quite a few years, and sometimes the uh, hard drive doesn't uh, work as well as it should. The vaccine. So I'm not going to talk about the vaccine like I just did. Instead, I, I want to talk about what what is a pandemic. Now, a pandemic is obviously some type of sickness that impacts not just towns and cities or countries, but the entire world. And yes, the coronavirus has been a pandemic, but remember every year the flu virus, we've had the bird flu, we've had so many other pandemics that have impacted the entire world that this is not new. Remember, this is COVID-19. Um, this particular virus, is, virus has been around for well over a thousand years. Uh, it's just a new form, and as viruses typically do, they mutate from one form to the next. But my question is, is it a pandemic? When you hear the word pandemic, I think it tends to scare people because they immediately think, oh my goodness, I'm going to get it too. Everybody's going to get it, and we're all going to die. No, that's not a pandemic. That is a plague. The coronavirus is not a plague. It will eventually be gone. And uh, I know something about plagues because in 2012, I wrote my first novel called Not Without Mercy, The Black Death. And it's a story of a family that survives the Black Plague of 1348 in Bristol, England. Now, again, I'm not making light of the coronavirus or the fact that it's a pandemic. But I'm telling you, it's not a plague. Because as you would read in my book, uh, Not Without Mercy, um, I have extensive historical notes in here explaining what is a plague. And the fact that millions and millions of people throughout the world died of the Black Plague, or the Black Death as it was known in those days, that is a plague. That is something that is deadly to anyone, anyone who comes in contact with it, regardless of their health. So my heart goes out to the many, many people around the world who have died of this virus, the COVID-19. But I, I want you to, to have some hope. It's not a plague and it will pass and we will live another day, the vast majority of people, when, nine, when over 99% of the people who become infected with it survive. That's not what happened with the Black Plague. The vast majority of people who were infected with the Black Plague, they died within days. Some died within hours. And the thing that happened to those people, the 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 people were not prepared for something like that. 
And some horrible things happened to people who got the plague and people who didn't have the plague, but the authorities thought they did. I mean, there was a time in England when if someone in a household, uh, if people knew that they had the plague, they would bar the door shut with the entire household in the house and burn the house to the ground while people are alive. Yes, sometimes they did this for people that did have the plague, but many times people who were, were healthy, just like you and I, they were, they were killed by the authorities, by people freaking out over the plague. So all I would say is let's not freak out. So let me go back to what I wanted to talk about today. I want to talk about my books. Uh, I'm excited to announce that uh, I have a new website. Um, I will put it right below here. The name of the website is thestorytellercollection.com. One more time, that is the storyteller, one word. Actually, it's all one word. Thestorytellercollection.com. Go there, and uh, you'll be able to see all of my books, including uh, my first two books in the Not Without Mercy series, um, and my latest book, and a little sneak peek of a new book that I'm working on with another author that I'm really, really excited about. Um, the other thing that I'm excited about is that I'm actually finally doing some audio versions of my books. Um, this is what I hear from readers all the time. It seems like nowadays is we want to listen to our books. I will admit I listen to books all the time. So if you go to the storytellercollection.com, right now you can download the audio version of my most recent book, Men Against Messiah, The Sanhedrin Plot Against Jesus. Um, and I am planning on having the audio version done of my Not Without Mercy series, as well as upcoming books, as soon as possible. Let me talk just a little bit about this book, Men Against Messiah, The Sanhedrin Plot Against Jesus. It's interesting because I wrote this book while I was doing research for another book. And by the time I finished my research, I was talking to my wife about it and reading some of it. And she said, Phil, that's a book. What you've, what you've put together is valuable and you need, to, you need to make that into a book. So I did. So let me tell you just a little bit about this book. I am writing a book. I've been working on it for quite a while called The Arm of the Flesh. And this is the story of a man in Israel at the time of Christ. And his son, um, in his mid-30s, a very successful scribe, which in those days was a lawyer, is invited to become a member of the Sanhedrin. Now, the Sanhedrin were not just the religious group of the Jews, but they were actually a very strong political arm used by the Romans to keep the Jews in check. And the Sanhedrin at the time of Christ were... Well, they were pretty wicked. That's an understatement. They were extremely wicked. And this story, this, this young man in his 30s is invited to be a member of the Sanhedrin. But before he actually becomes a member of the Sanhedrin, his father, who's in his mid-50s, comes to him one day and tells him that he has just met the most incredible person, a prophet like unlike any other prophet he's ever heard and the things that he's teaching the people are amazing and his son says to him father you need to stay away from this man most likely he's another false prophet like we've seen many times and his father said no i i believe he may be the messiah the sought after messiah that we've been waiting for for thousands of years well at that point his son became very nervous and frustrated and said, Father, he's a false messiah. Stay away from him. And then he said to him, Father, I am going to be a member of the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin do not look kindly to false messiahs, so please stay away from him. So as the story goes on, the father doesn't stay away from him, follows him, and witnesses many incredible miracles by this man known as Yeshua, a name that we refer to in English today as Jesus. 
And he comes to his son again and tells him his name is Yeshua and he is the Messiah. And I've witnessed miracles. Well, at this point, his son is beyond scared now and he's, he's terrified that his brethren, the Sanhedrin, are going to find out that his father is following another false messiah. So he tells his father, Father, please, please, I beg you, your life, your life will be in danger if you continue this. Please, Father, stay away from this man. Well, just imagine if you were living on the earth at the time Jesus walked the earth. Just imagine if you were a Jew living at the time of Jesus and you had the opportunity to hear him speak. Just imagine if you had the opportunity to witness him heal people from all kinds of afflictions and sicknesses. Just imagine if you had the opportunity to witness him raise Lazarus from the dead. Not someone who had just recently died, but a man who had been dead and was placed in a tomb for several days. As a matter of fact, the people said to Jesus when he came, he stinketh. His body is rotting and dying. And yet you witnessed Jesus say, Lazarus, come forth. And you watched a dead man come out of his grave alive and well. The character in this book, the father, could not simply ignore the things that he was hearing and most likely witnessed. And true to what his son told him would happen, he was murdered by the order of a member of the Sanhedrin. But that's not the end of the story. That's actually the very beginning of the story. Because after Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead, there is an incredible scripture in the New Testament. Incredible scripture in the New Testament that talks about how the graves of many were opened and they went unto the city and they saw their loved ones. My young character who's becoming a Sanhedrin has a knock on his door one day, still mourning the death of his father. He opens the door and his father is standing there, alive, again, raised from the dead. And his father says to him, My son, Yeshua, is the Messiah. He is the Christ, the Son of God. Well, it changed everything for this young, almost Sanhedrin. That's the premise of the story, and I'm so excited to finish it. But in order for it to be a true historical fiction, I had to get the history part down. I had to learn something more about the Sanhedrin than we all kind of know. So as I was doing my research, I came across a book that was written a couple hundred years ago, and it was written by a Catholic priest who he and his twin brother were actually Jewish. And he was converted at the age of 18 to Christianity. Later, as I mentioned, he became a Catholic priest. And as a Catholic priest, sorry, I'm, I'm running through this. As a Catholic priest, he started writing books and doing research. And he wrote a book called 
Jesus before the Sanhedrin. Now, he spelled it Sanhedrin with an M. We're used to it as Sanhedrin with an N. His name was Augustine Lamont. I found that an original 18, and he was French, by the way. I found an original 1886 English translation of his book. Uh, I've got it right here somewhere. I should have grabbed it when I was going to do this podcast because it is so cool to see this old book, well over 100 years old. And I read the book, and the English translation was not as good as it could have been. So I started taking the book and translating it again into more modern English. I don't mean slang, I just mean English with words that we could understand a little bit better. But the most miraculous thing about this book is that this Catholic priest had done his research using the Talmud, the Tribunal of the Maccabees, the Greek text, the original text of the Gospels, uh, information from the famous Jewish historian Josephus, the Mishnah, which is the the oral written Jewish law. And he discovered the vast majority of, of the actual men who were part of the Sanhedrin. Not just their names, but who they were, what they did, what they were like. And it was amazing the things he discovered again, that were written about them in Jewish literature, Jewish journals and books, history. And these were not good men. In fact, as I had mentioned earlier, they were evil. They were nasty, nasty people. And uh, I was so intrigued by this that I decided I need to write a book around the book. So that's what I did. That's my book, Man Against Messiah, The Sanhedrin Plot Against Jesus. The first few chapters, the first chapter I wrote was, Who Was Jesus of Nazareth? Now, I didn't write a book about the life of Jesus, but I wanted to write a book that explained what happened, what caused these Sanhedrin to become so worried and concerned about this new person claiming to be Messiah that they would do the things they did and eventually why they would break their own laws and rules in a very illegal trial against him. And my book details at least 20 different legal things they did that were illegal. They were wrong. They were a violation of the Mishnah, of the Talmud, of Roman law. Things they did to eventually condemn and crucify Jesus. Things they had never gotten away with before, they got away with to crucify the Messiah, the Son of God. So I wrote uh, uh, my first chapter, Who Was Jesus? I talk about who he was, where he came from. And I talk and I clarify some misconceptions. One of the things that I learned in my studies, you, you hear that Jesus was a carpenter. And... We think of a carpenter as somebody who works with wood. But the Greek translation of carpenter wasn't talking about someone who worked with wood. As a matter of fact, the little town he lived in in Nazareth Nazareth, had a stone quarry. It didn't have carpenters working on wood, but it did have a lot of people working in the stone quarry. And as I got more into it, I discovered that he wasn't a wood carpenter. He was most likely a stonemason. Now that doesn't change, that doesn't change the gospel. And it it surely shouldn't sway anybody's faith in Christ. But it's the things that we take for granted because we hear over and over. And I explain in detail why I came to that conclusion. And I give the references to justify the conclusion that he was not a wood carpenter. He was a stonemason. And then I talk about the earthly Messiah, and I explain how Jesus was able to sit in the temple and totally surprise all of these learned men, Pharisees, Sadducees, members of the Sanhedrin. Why was he 
allowed to be in the temple. Well, the reality, it, it wasn't something unique. It was part of the bar mitzvah when a boy turns 12. Part of that process is they sit at the feet of the learned men and they have to recite the things that they've learned. So that was the main reason he was there, but I explain how he got separated from Joseph and Mary because the big question is, wait a minute, how can they get all the way back from Jerusalem, all the way back to their town and discover Jesus isn't with them? How could that have happened? Well, I explain how it happened and it's very logical and simple and it makes sense. I have another chapter called The Son of Man. Christ referred to himself as the Son of Man. Go into great detail. And I go into great detail using the Old Testament to show how prophets like Daniel actually predicted the year and the month that Jesus would be born. It's all right there in the scriptures. So I talk about that when he was, the, and I show all of the prophecy explaining and showing what the ancient prophets prophesied, Isaiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, about the coming forth of the Messiah, when he would be born, the actual year he would be born. It's all there in the scriptures, and I, I detail it in my book. So that part is, is quite enlightening. Um, I have another chapter called The Sign of Jonah. I, I don't want to spend too much more time talking about this, but if you go to my website right now, thestorytellercollection.com, you can actually download the audio version of the book. You can download, or you can get the paperback, you can get the ebook, or you can get all three. Or if you'd like, you can just listen on the website to chapter three, one of my favorite chapters in the book, called The, Son of jo the Sign of Jonah. And in this chapter, I explain how Jonah could be swallowed by a well and three days later could be alive standing on the shore. And you might be surprised at the conclusion I come to. The story of Jonah and the well was not just a fairy tale. It was not a cute little children's story to get the kids to go to sleep at night in ancient uh, Jerusalem. No, it was a real story of a real event that all the Jews knew about. They all knew the story and they understood the story. They understood something about the story that we completely miss. Because Jesus uses this as a sign when the Pharisees want to have him give them a sign after seeing so many things. And he said, I'm not going to give you any sign except the sign of Jonah. And then he said, Jonah was dead I'm sorry, Jonah was in the belly of the well for three days, just as the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth for three days, and he will rise again. I kind of let the cat out of the bag. Yes, I will explain to you in my book why Jonah was dead in the well. He wasn't sitting on a log uh, like Pinocchio, floating inside the well, belly of the well, waiting for his opportunity to escape. No. He was dead, and I'll show you in the book and you can understand why. Then I talk about the miracles of Jesus and and I explain how it was difficult for his apostles, the 12 apostles to even understand it. This was all new to them. Some of the things he did were, they were all miraculous, but some of the things he did had actually been done in the Old Testament. I mean, Moses part of the Red Sea. So somebody walking on water, is that more dramatic than parting an entire ocean? I don't know. I couldn't do either. But I talk about these things, and I, I help the reader understand that the apostles were just as human as you and me. They were lacking in faith at times. They had to learn. They had to grow. And they eventually, all but one of them, became incredible men who every single one of them gave their life as a martyr for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then the rest of the book goes through the actual trial, who the Sanhedrin were, all three groups of the Sanhedrin, their names, something about them, things that will shock you. And then it goes through the entire process of the trial that took place over two days, detailing the events and all of the laws that the Sanhedrin broke as they were trying to condemn Jesus. Then the last few chapters, I go into the detail of the crucifixion. I'll, I'll show, share, I will share some things with you in the book that you probably didn't know. 
about the process of crucifixion. Not only was it horrible and incredibly painful, but it was probably one of the most humiliating things a person could go through. And I detail that in the book so you understand it. And most importantly, my last chapter is on the resurrection. And I explain in detail the evidence that Jesus lived, that he died, and that three days later, he was resurrected with a physical and glorified body of flesh and bone. And I explain in detail how he could have a perfect body of flesh and bone when a lot of people misinterpret the scripture that says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. And that is correct because blood is the substance that makes us mortal. But just remember, when Jesus was on the cross, one of his apostles in the book of John details how all of the blood drained from his body. Yet three days later, he had a physical body of flesh and bone, a perfect body. He even ate and drank with the apostles. And then his physical body lifted up into heaven as the angel stood next to him and looked down at the men below and said, You men of Galilee, why gaze ye into the heavens? For the same Jesus that leaves you shall return in like manner. This book was not supposed to be a book, but it is, and I love it, and it's exciting. And it allows me to share my testimony of the Messiah, of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. I really hope you take the opportunity to go to my website and get your copy of this book. Again, you can get a paperback copy. It's only around 300 pages. You could read it uh, in a short amount of time. If you order the paperback, you'll also get the audio version free. Or you can just get the audio version, or you can, through Amazon.com, you can get the ebook. But either way, it's, it's a wonderful book, and I'm so excited about it, and I really hope you take the opportunity to get yourself a copy. All right, a couple more things I want to talk about. I'm real excited to be writing a new book with a dear friend of mine named Rick Nelson. This book is unlike anything I've ever written before. It is so very unique and exciting. It's the story. Um, it's a historical sci-fi fiction or a sci-fi historical fiction. It's basically a story of a man that I know that Rick knows very well and the miraculous events that have taken place in his life including people from other worlds and spirits good and bad and this story uh, we believe it's going to be an epic it'll be a series we're almost finished with book one we'll have it out hopefully around Christmas or shortly thereafter it's an incredible testimony of the plan of salvation. It's an incredible story of faith and understanding and hope and healing. It's a story that explains what it means when the Lord says that he created worlds without number. Now, if you're like me, you must believe we would be incredibly arrogant if we believed God created worlds without number but he only put people on this planet. No. We have brothers and sisters who look just like us all throughout the universe on different planets. So that's kind of a little sneak peek about this story, and I'm really, really excited about it. The name of the book in the series is called Return from Risa. And you can get a little bit of information about it by going to my new website, thestorytellercollection.com. And the last thing I want to say is uh, I have a wonderful friend named Michael Rush, who's the author of some incredible books. If you haven't read these, please, please go to his website. Go to his website and get a copy of them. A Remnant Shall Return. Revelation, The Visitation of John the Divine. I love all of them, but 
Daniel 11 is probably my favorite. Now, you can find all of his books at his website. Um, <laughs> I went blank here again. His website is, 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 I'm going to find it really quick. Oh, this is embarrassing. I thought for sure I had it right in front of me. His website is actually listed on my website, um, thestorytellercollection.com. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe I did that. Anyway, you can go to my website and get information about his books. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because uh, uh, Michael has become a wonderful friend. I just I love this man. I am so impressed by his wisdom, his knowledge, and his understanding of the scriptures. He has done something that has been so desperately needed, especially in our day. He has taken scriptures and prophecy and explained them in modern English in a way that anybody can understand it. Now, the, the uh, shocking part is he's brought, brought it to our attention that not only are we in the last days, but things are happening quickly. These revelations are unfolding right in front of our eyes. So I'm excited that uh, I'm actually going to be doing a podcast uh, in the next few days or so with Michael Rush. Uh, we'll be talking about his books. We're going to be talking a little bit about uh, my book, Man Against Messiah. And we're going to talk in a lot more detail about my new book I'm authoring again with my friend Rick Nelson called Return from Risa. So that's kind of my update. And it's been about 32 minutes. I'm sorry it took so long. But I'm so excited to have the opportunity to do this. It is great doing this again. Obviously, I can't see you. I can't hear you. But I know you're out there. Thank you so much for being my friend. And thank you for taking the opportunity to listen. And again, I really hope you go to my website, thestorytellercollection.com. Check out the books. If nothing else, uh, listen to a couple of the chapters of two of my books right there on the website. Um, and download any of them. And feel free to send me a message at the website. There's a place to do that as well. Thank you so much. I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And I hope you and your loved ones stay well. God bless, my friends.